Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, my sister's at it again. She was asking me, what should I be worrying about now that I've been vaccinated five times and been infected twice? What about the next pandemic? So, you know, it's a good thought because the country right now is approaching the next pandemic a lot like Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine, whose famous phrase was, what me worry? It was great, very good humor magazine, but Alfred E. Newman is probably who's running our approach to pandemics. So if you think about it, the two most likely sources are gonna be flu, which we've been hearing a lot in the newspapers about this bird flu, uh, avian H5N1, or another coronavirus. So let's just talk a little bit about both of those in anticipation of what we should be worried about, Janet. So first of all, flu virus, I've shown you this picture before. Flu virus is an RNA virus that has two major uh, structures on the outside, the hemagglutin and the neuraminidase that really for influenza A describes uh, the virus. We call it you know, H1N1 like this year. It has many other proteins, the polymerase, the matrix proteins that are also very important. And so the thing about influenza A is it mutates a lot. And so there are eight, so far 18 different hemagglutinins and 11 neuraminidases and they infect wild geese, people, pigs, and bats in some cases. And so this year, for example, 71% uh, of the flu was in influenza A. And as I said, they were named after the hemagglutin and the neuraminidase. And so 70% of this year's flu virus was uh, uh, H1N1. Late in the, in the season, there's been a little bit more H3N1, but the vaccine contained H1N1. The, and about 30% or less was um, influenza B, which for reasons unclear to me, uh, are named after where they were isolated. So Victoria, Australia, or Yamagata are the strains. This year, it's been 100% Victoria strain, and uh, Yamagata seems to maybe have even disappeared. There was none this year in the world. So what happens? Why are what should we be worried about? Well, in wild avian species, there's all these different proteins, just like everything else, and it can recombine with a, a, a virus that is also in, can infect people. So the big concern is H5N1, which is what we call a highly pathogenic avian virus, a, a, avian influenza. There are other ones that are called low pathogenic, uh, but the, why, why the concern? Well, so globally, uh, there's been a, this increase in H5N1, which is highly pathogenic and a concern for whether it could ever transmit to humans. So it's been reported already in uh, a number of mammal species. You know, I've been talking about it's mostly in birds, but here it's now been reported in mammal species in Asia, North America, South America, and Europe. And it's included mammalian species like sea lions in Peru and Chile, sea elephants in Argentina, and foxes in Canada and France. And more recently in bears and seals, cats and dogs, farm animals such as goats, cows, and mink, and zoo animals such as tigers and leopards. And this year, as I talked to, you know, I think I mentioned it a month ago or so, uh, in baby goats, as you can see the Alfred E. Newman combined with the baby goat. So, okay, it's fine, it's in those mam mammalian species, so why should we worry? Well, the concern is, will it jump to man if it's for another mammalian species? Well, in January in 22, uh, there was a an H5N1 reported in an asymptomatic 80-year-old who happened to raise ducks in England. There have been two cases, there's a case in uh, the United States and in China in 2022. Uh, and in October in Vietnam and in, in January of 23 Equi in Ecuador, there was a human infection in children. So uh, it is beginning to be seen more and more in individuals. Now the, what happens if it gets into man, it seems to be exposed to poultry in the backyard who probably got infected by wild birds or like this guy in England who was ha handling ducks. So it gets into humans and it seems to be a dead end. So in other words, it's not able to transmit man to man, but the big concern of course is will it? And, and this is for Janet's benefit. Bird flu, H5N1, was detected in several uh, geese, peregrine fal uh, falcons, and a red-tailed hawk, as well as a chicken in Marcus Garvey Park, which is 10 blocks from my sister's house. So they're all plotting against you, Janet. There's no question, they're coming to get you. But what about, but what about coronaviruses? 
You know, we've talked a lot about that's, you know, SARS-CoV-2. But remember, SARS-CoV-1 started in November 2002 and lasted to 2004. And that was a very pathogenic virus. Remember, it killed almost 60% of the people who got infected. And it, it, was, it originated in horseshoe bats, just like SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and we thought the intermediate species was Asian palm civets. Then, in 2012, there was uh, uh, MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Similar uh, coronavirus, was the reservoir was in dromedary camels, and that has continued to circulate. And, and as of March 2024, there have been 2,600 cases of, of MERS with 939 deaths reported. And so this particular coronavirus does jump to people. It's still around. It's not really infectious as bad as uh, this year's SARS-CoV-2, but again, it's another reservoir. And as we talked about before, remember the people who live around bat caves in Hunan, many of them have antibodies to uh, several of the coronaviruses that are in bats, so it's constantly jumping into people, just like we mentioned the flu, H5N1, but it seems to hit a dead end most of the time. <laughs> the problem is, of course, except when it doesn't. So when it doesn't, if it acquires something in an immediate species, that will then induce uh, a, a global pandemic. So those are the two most likely scenarios. Uh, a coronavirus that's in a reservoir in bats jumps to an intermediate species again uh, and into us, uh, or uh, something like an avian flu of H5N1 that jumps in to uh, uh, mammals and then into us. So. If we're planning, if we're not being Alfred E. Newman and we're thinking ahead, we should be not only surveilling those species and those reservoirs, but, but developing vaccines in anticipation in case something should happen. So that's the bad news. The good news is everything's looking good. Our hospitalizations are down for SARS-CoV-2. Right now, the major hospitalizations are due to flu, not to uh, coronavirus. <clears throat> Waste acti wastewater activity nationally is down at its lowest. And in Houston, we're down to 89% of the number that was in, uh, in 2020. So uh, very, very, looking very good. And again, the most important thing is not a lot of major mutations taking place. JN.1 is the major species here in purple with uh, JN.1.13, uh, about 10%. So one last thing I want to remind people, the importance of vaccination. Uh, just looking at um, long COVID effect, in general, it's been uh, slowing, and this has been seen uh, over the study published out of England. Uh, while a lot of people have been infected, uh, as you can see, it's slowly but surely drifting down because we haven't had a lot of new long COVID. But here's the most important fact. Two studies, both out of Lancet Respiratory Medicine, looking at the impact of vaccination. So uh, a good study and from the UK, Spain, and Estonia showed that vaccine consistently prevented long COVID. And then a, a really interesting study out of Norway looked at the entire population of 5.4 million people. And again, vaccines consistently protected you from long COVID. So I have no idea who out there is not getting vaccinated unless they are Alfred E. Newman. Let me worry. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, a big shout out to the middle school students who came to visit us at Baylor College of Medicine. As you um, may have heard or known, I forget if I've talked about it, but uh, we uh, are affiliated with uh, the independent school district and run the, co the curriculum in two middle schools, Medicine Academy at Ryan uh, and also the uh, Academy at Rusk, as well as the Stanford STEM Magnet Academy. And they all came to visit. Uh, I want a big shout out to the students uh, and also uh, to all the faculty and, and students who are here in the medical school who, who reached out to them. Also, this week is Biomedical uh, Research Awareness. Uh, they had this Research Awareness Day this past week. Uh, it's an important day where we take time to remember all the animals that participate in biomedical research that are so important to advancing science. I would also uh, uh, shout out to the Michael E. DeBakey Excellence in Research Awards. Uh, this week uh, we announced the recipients of the, the awards. They were Dr. Bob Atmar, Professor of Medicine and ID, Dr. Christine Beaton, Professor of Integrative Physiology, Dr. Jeffrey McGee, Professor of Neuroscience, Dr. McMonkin, Professor, uh, Associate Professor of Pathology and Immunology, uh, Le uh, Dr. Leonid Mendelitsa, who is a Professor of Pediatrics at Hemonk, and uh, Dr. Bing Zhang, Professor of Molecular and Human Genetics. And finally, a big shout out to the uh, Boston Marathon winners. 
So say Lemma, who won for the first time in a time of two uh, hours and six minutes and 17 seconds, and Helen O'Beary, who won her third marathon in a row and her second Boston marathon for, in women, 222.37. And to say, Lemma, thank you for showing that someone besides Kenya, a Kenyan, can win a marathon. And I, I have a special thing in my heart for the Boston Marathon because uh, I failed to qualify uh, one minute and they wouldn't let me in. I hate them. Anyway, uh, have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>